that we recently did as about supply chain blockchain uh, supply chain blockchain platform. <coughs> Yeah, good evening everyone. Yeah, our time is uh, fast spent, so I'll try to be as uh, fast as possible. <coughs> My name is Nife Odiemi. Uh, if you're trying to like figure out where the name is from, I'm Nigerian. And then I'm a software engineer at Manulife, just downtown uh, Kitchener. I actually just finished um, a master's program at the University of Windsor and uh, it's during that time that I had the opportunity to um, build a platform that I, I am going to talk about uh, today. And I thank uh, Mary so much for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, today. So last summer, uh, while everybody was having a good time in the sun and, every, and enjoying themselves on their vacation, I was stuck in school. And I was stuck with my brother and not, not stuck like prison or in that, but it was, we just, uh, we had to um, stay in school for two months to come up with a project to, uh, any project of our discretion to, uh, to, to build something. So since we had two months, we kind of like realized we had to do something tasking, something that would like take our time, something that would push us um, beyond our comfort zone, something we don't uh, normally that we haven't uh, done before. And normally with those kind of school projects, we kind of want to do all these uh, crowd, project, crowd projects, create, create, update, delete, and uh, we decided to go um, a step further together and do something that will push us uh, outside of our comfort zone. And what we stuck, what we, um, stuck with was supply, supply chain blockchain. And um, I will walk you through why we uh, chose that platform, but uh, we we had to understand everything with um, blockchain and supply chain to be able to implement uh, the software we implemented. Now, um, George asked me when we started that uh, did I use Hyperledger or any other um, blockchain platform, but we didn't use that. We built the blockchain from scratch, so we we used like a different concept to um, implement the blockchain from scratch. So <clears throat> on that, and we also, it was like a proof of concept, so it was an MVP proof of concept uh, software. So on that note, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce you to like the Internet of Information. And this is what we know to be like the client server model um, of the Internet today, how the Internet has been able to um, make communication between um, people easier and make the world smaller. And um, you know, we have the client server model where um, whatever the client is seeing is, is a copy of whatever is on the server. And um, <clears throat> as we try to move further into um, the internet and move further into the technology age, um, we should start to look at the internet of value. So taking that internet of information, how do we make that communication to be able to transmit items of value and um, which brings us to the topic of blockchain and blo how blockchain has helped us to solve um, moving uh, transfer of value between, um, between participants on uh, the internet. So, so blockchain, yeah, like I said, it's, it was the solution uh, to, because if you look at the internet of information, if I want to send something to you, take for example the document, what I'm sending to you is a copy of that document. And uh, the, the, the original copy still stays with me. But if you now want to transfer things like money, how do we make sure that when I transfer that money to you, uh, I delete it on my end to, for things for integrity's sake? So what is this blockchain we speak of? Well, George has, um, has given us a very, very broad overview of um, blockchain. So, but one, one, mini, one um, definition I want you all to speak with today is that, and I want you to speak, uh, have that back in your mind is, blockchain is a continuously updated distributed ledger that records who holds what. 
So it records that item of value, it records who holds that. So basically, who holds what? So, if, for example, like in the case, in the example of Bitcoin, a particular, like the money, who holds the money at a particular uh, time? So we know the most um, popular implementation of blockchain was introduced in early 2009 uh, was Bitcoin by Satoshi Nakamoto and uh, there have been so many search to look for Satoshi Nakamoto all have been uh, a failure. Uh, I, I recently heard that there was a time they uh, took this um, Chinese professor and accused him of being Satoshi but he looked confused and he was in the band. Also in, uh, Late 2013, Ethereum was introduced as a form of allowing developers to get money for their app, uh, for decentralized apps uh, directly. So really, a blockchain is a chain of blocks, and um, in each block, <coughs> in each block that's, um, I'm just, that this is just the basic, it contains the index, the hash, the hash of the previous block, which has been said is used to um, provide the links between each block data and transaction, and the data and transaction differ between the type of um, blockchain we're dealing with. It, it differs, so if it's Bitcoin, it's, if the data transaction is the money transfer, let's say it's insurance claim, it's the documents. And the nonce, I put an asterisk there because um, there are different types of consensus algorithm, but if you're using proof of work, uh, the nonce is uh, what the network will use to verify the solution, and there's the timestamp. <coughs> Uh, the JSON object of that. So this, the idea of mining, if a new block wants to enter the block, a cryptographic puzzle has to be solved. And when that puzzle is solved, <coughs> it's verified, the, the solution is verified by the network, and after that, it's added to the, to, to the blockchain. So one more, uh, one concept I'll talk about more is the public key, private key, and uh, <coughs> How I explain it is that uh, the, uh, the private key is randomly generated and the public key is generated from the private key. And why it's used in blockchain is it's used to verify transactions to say, um, if a transaction is coming from me, how do, I, how do we verify, how does the, um, the network verify that that transaction is coming from me? So it uses, so transactions are signed with the initiator's private key and when it goes to the um, in the in the network, the the network that the blockchain network uses the public key of that user because it's the public key that, that is spread in the network. They use the public key of that user to verify that that transaction is from the user. And another thing is that the public key and the private key is stored independent of the network. It's not stored in the blockchain uh, network. So with all this and how um, blockchain has. Um, how we, the, the world has understood blockchain as this, the creativity was unleashed. Many businesses started, started to think of creative ways to implement the technology. It's the same with the case of um, Ethereum, where um, you could use it to, um, for developers to get money directly um, for their applications. And there were so many um, implementations, so many implementations that come up on blockchain because basically the type of um, technology so in any situation where data integrity is needed, blockchain technology can be applied to solve a uh, problem. So uh, some various applications of uh, blockchain insurance, cloud, cloud storage, um, intellectual property, you can use in voting, keeping of medical records, real estate where um, a, a piece of um, real estate is tokenized, or you can use it to show, to record who holds a property at a particular time, and also um, supply chain, which we chose. Now, one interesting um, implementation of blockchain that, that I heard of recently was in China, and it was on the Me Too um, campaign. <coughs> because in um, China, is um, the, the, the censorship in China in terms of the kind of um, sites that um, the citizens visit. So, 70% um, of uh, Chinese um, female students complained of uh, sexual abuse at some point in time, and <clears throat> so they started sharing their me too stories on social networks. But, but the government started um, censoring 
the Mitsu hashtag. They also um, censored the Chinese meaning of Mitsu, Ueshi, they censored that. And they censored uh, like a Chinese spelling of Mitsu, Mitsu, which means rice bunny. And the government also censored that. So um, these students started sharing their stories on blockchain. And you know, the way blockchain is, the data is immutable. And it can be, um, it's, it's a peer to peer, it's not centralized. So the government couldn't um, censor that. So over to, uh, we named the project Supply Blockchain because we can't have two chains, in supply chain and blockchain. So we just cut it short, Supply Blockchain. <coughs> Now, uh, this is a shoemaker shop in the 19th century. And <clears throat> all you had to do then, if you wanted a shoe, was you just had to walk into the store or walk into the shoemaker's uh, shop, get your feet measured, and uh, <clears throat> once that's done, the shoemaker goes and get the, the cow's hide, that cow skin, he turns it into leather and produces your shoe for you. And one fun fact is that Back then, there was no right leg or left leg. There was no right foot or right left foot. It was all the same. And uh, so, and we can see that that process is it was very simple. It was within their immediate environment. So, uh, and the problem with that is that it doesn't scale. And has, as technology has um, has been pushed into the uh, pushed into technology, um, we start to find different ways to make supply chains scale. So basically, um, when you have the, in modern days now, when you have the um, raw material, that's the cow uh, skin, it's moved to the factory. From the factory, it's moved to uh, the factory warehouse. Factory warehouse, it's moved to, um, it's shipped overseas. From shipping overseas, it's moved to um, uh, fulfillment centers. Fulfillment centers is installed before it gets to you. Now, within all these processes, there are various logistics involved moving, um, which may be separate companies on its own. And also, within each of these nodes, everyone has their own data silos where you store their own data. Now, the problem with this is that one problem is data synchronization. So, data is not synchronized amongst all these parties in the supply chain. And everyone is keeping their own data because I can't trust your let's say you are uh, another party, I can't trust you to keep data from so I keep my own data. So everyone is keeping their own data. This causes, um, this causes errors in data. When check out uh, the nodes, the different uh, data in each um, node in the supply chain is, is different. It causes error. They can be fraud because I, I can do whatever I like on my uh, system. Now, we let's not also forget that there is government involved, there are lawyers, intermediaries, their banks. So it's a really, really complex, um, um, so it's a really, really complex uh, supply chain uh, process. Now they looked at technology today and looked at which solutions that technology provides will have the most impact on supply chain. And in third place, it was advanced analytics to be able to provide analytics on all the um, data in supply chain because there was, there's a fact that for a single good in today's supply chain um, process, there are about 21,000 data points. So you can see that there's a lot of uh, data involved. And in second place, it was system integration that with um, different um, systems of uh, the different parties in supply chain to be able to integrate them together. And number one is supply chain visibility. This will have the most impact on supply chain. So uh, having this, we decided that that we wanted to, this was the solution we wanted to solve with our blockchain, supply chain visibility, to be able to, um, for assets to be tracked transparently um, within the parties of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the network. So we chose our supply chain visibility, and we said, based on what we know, based on what we've understood from, um, from blockchain, how can we use it to, how can we use it to implement that in a supply chain? So <clears throat> the first decision we had to take is what kind of what type of blockchain would it be? Would it be a, would it be a public blockchain or a private blockchain? And public blockchain, as the name implies, is, is it's open to everybody. Anybody can come in 
um, anybody can add transactions, anybody can mine uh, that type of thing. And private is um, restricted to um, restricted to um, authorized parties. Now I put permission there because um, permission is sort of like the hybrid between the public blockchain and the private blockchain. And permission permission can be permission is vast. It's vast. It can be say maybe um, some set of authorized people can mine. Maybe the public can view. Maybe some set of people can add transactions. That kind of, it just depends on the kind of permission you want to put on that blockchain. And what we decided to um, go with was um, permission uh, blockchain for the <coughs> permission blockchain. So an overview of like the system architecture, we built it with a Flask. It was a Flask application with Python. And remember I said, um, the private key and the public key has to be stored independent of the network. So we, we created a database, and I know that it may uh, kind of like spark like questions, why would we use database when I try to create a, a blockchain server? But we kind of wanted to, uh, we needed a place to store the public, the public key and the private key of each user in the, in the network. So uh, if you take, for example, like Coinbase, for example, if you create a crypto wallet on Coinbase, um, they, they create the public key and private key for you and store it in their own database. So we have to store in our database. And it was the model view controller um, architecture, and it was our controller that communicates with the blockchain server, because we had a blockchain server that was independent of the um, the, the web application. So the the blockchain server has two endpoints. Simply get chain, which gets the long, which gets the all the um, blocks, the blockchain returns the blockchain, and add a new transaction. Add a new transaction. The process is to validate the transaction, verify the transaction, get the block type. I'll talk about block type in a bit. It generates or copies a node ID and it does the mine. So <clears throat> this is one decision we had to take. We had to determine um, because we're we're doing um we're we're tracking we're trying to track assets um, in assets uh, how assets is moved. So we had to create two types of block in the blockchain. In, in the blockchain, an initiated block and a track block. And I'll, I'll explain it like this. Uh, say, for example, um, a user initiates, uh, puts like, uh, say, for example, computers, like 1,000 uh, computer systems in the, in the, in the, he initiates like a new transaction. That's an initiated transaction. But to keep track of that, that would be a tracked transaction. And that's why we did it like that. Also remember, in, George said in, in the in a Bitcoin block, um, there, there are a list of transactions that are summarized by Merkle, key, Mer, by summarized by Merkle trees, but we um, kept it to one transaction per block because with, with um, supply chain, you don't want to, um, you don't want to wait for like, another transaction to happen because it may take a long time for another transaction to happen before like putting it together. Because if you look at Bitcoin, so many transactions happen per minute, so it's easy to put uh, so many transactions um, in one block. But with us, take for example, I initiate the transaction, I'm waiting for the other person to accept or the other um, party to uh, move the goods. It may take a long time, so we have to keep it to one transaction um, per block. And also, we mine, because it's a permission database and it's not a public, uh, database. We mine the transactions immediately. It's added into the chain, so we, we verify the transaction before it's added to the chain. So um, when the web application starts, we see the database with three users: um, Walmart, who is a retailer; um, Topline Farms, who is a supplier; and uh, Canada Post, who is the uh, courier and also generate their public key and private key. 
So we, we, we kept it really simple. We wanted to show um, how goods m move between the um, three, three parties, retailer, supplier, and the courier, or the carrier. Now, when, um, when our blockchain server starts, uh, a genesis block is in, a genesis block is created, and the genesis block is the first um, secure block on the chain. It has to be added so that the incoming uh, transaction has a parent to uh, get linked link to. So I want to um, show an overview of, um, say, for example, Walmart initiates a transaction that they want 600 apples from the um, from top line farms. So <clears throat> a new transaction is uh, initiated and the status is spending and the actor is Walmart. So Walmart says, I need 600 apples from top line farms. So top line farms can either reject the, they can reject the, um, the request or they can accept the request. And once they accept the request, the status change, change to approve that the block type is tracked now. The block type is tracked and the actor is top line. And once they accept, they can, they can um, update the status. And how we did this, updating the status was just manual typing, manual typing. And uh, they can update the status ready for shipping and the uh, same actor is on top line. Then they can send the package over to um, Canada Post and it says that we're transferring the asset that 600 apples is sending it to Canada Post and the status has changed to shipped and it goes, Canada Post can then update the um, status and say delivered which, um, which, which is added to the, um, which a, a new transaction is added, that a new track transaction is added, and then Walmart will have to say they've received it. Walmart will say, I have received it. That's to prove that the transaction has reached uh, Walmart. Yes. The, the guys who accept, you said it's manual. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so the, we go to the, you use the blockchain that is a trusted uh, storage, yeah. but the, the guy who accepts, how you are sure that he's trusted, yeah? Because you get then in the situation, garbage in, garbage out, yeah? yeah. If, if that guy is not trusted, then what blockchain records is not true. The, um, top line accepts, top line is stored in, in our database, but when we accept, it is created as a new transaction in it is created as a new transaction in in the in the blockchain. So and that is this transaction and approved and approved that it's approving this and it's approving the this initiated um, block. Now that block is tracked. That block, if I go back now. Um, they init um, Walmart initiates a transaction, and <clears throat> to keep track of that tra the initiated transaction, to keep track of it, we use the node ID, and that accept the, uh, when he accepts, accept is a new transaction, and the kind of um, the kind of block it is is a track block, so he adds it um, to the blockchain. a new track block that says the, instead of the status here to be approved, it will be rejected. Okay. Yeah. And that's the end of the... And, and for example, if the actors are going to be, for example, from top line to Canada Post, yeah. they have to do the same thing, like status pending for like sending the apples, the other one has to approve, that they are going to be moving the apples, and et cetera, et cetera, and like that there are going to be a lot of negotiations between parties. Uh, no, no, for this, that um, when, when shipping, we only did that, the accept and reject with the supplier and the, um, the, the, su the retail and the supplier. But moving it to um, the courier, we didn't do it with that. Okay. We, just, we just transfer it straight to the, 
in the fast high school. Program. So, for example, the Canada Post kind of move the items that you that the supplier agrees to move, and the, that basically is going to stop and not going it cannot be tracked. No, it can be tracked. It can be. Can Yes. yes. Okay, so okay, okay. I understand. The will be there in the and that's what we can. Okay. Yeah. And we also made that um, Canada Post can transfer to other couriers too, in okay. case it has to change times. Okay. Um, so I also thought about the transaction really quickly. Um, still the same 600 apples. Um, we're sending that. Um, we're sending that 600 apples to uh, top line. And the block that is initiated, and we're taking Walmart's public key and private key from database. We sign that transaction with um, Walmart's private key, and the signature is created. And what we are actually signing is a dictionary object of that transaction. So if it's if it's an initiated block, we'll sign the actor supplier item of quantity, and for the track block. Um, it's just the actor, the career, and the status. So after this, um, once um, a signature is created for the transaction, it's sent to the blockchain server, and then we validate the request. So if it's a block type, we want to, what validation means is check that, check the transaction that's coming. Does it contain the elements that we want? To, to ensure, like, does it contain um, a particular type of element? And if it's tracked, does it contain um, this um, type of the, the keys in the transaction? That's just to validate it. If if the data that, that's because of data integrity, because the data in each um, the data in each block has to be the same, depending on the block type. So we want to check if that the, the data that's coming in has the fields that we want. So you check if it has the required um, fields. And once that happens, we verify the transaction. Remember I said that um, with the permission, um, permission blockchain, the, once the transaction is initiated, it is mined automatically because, because we can trust the network, because we, it's between trusted um, parties. So we verify the transaction in the blockchain with Walmart's public key to ensure that it's really coming from Walmart. And when that is successful, we generate a node ID. Now the node ID in our case was the, is the other ID. That just like the other, that um, just like the normal, like the normal order ID, it's we, um, we use the node ID to represent the other ID. And the other ID, remember I said we have an initiated block and a track block. In a track block, a track block references the, the node ID of an initiated block, something like a foreign key, to keep track of, to, to keep track of the, to keep track of the initiated block. So once all this is uh, successful, then we go to mining. And sorry for putting um, a technical um, program, technical programming um, code here, but. Um, it's auto mining, like I said, and our mining difficulty is two. Now, what mining is, is um, a cryptographic puzzle has to be solved, and this is our own cryptographic puzzle. Remember, George said um, that the nonce is being used, that the nonce is used, and the nonce is used to, um, create a, a, to create a hash, and to check if the hash contains a particular, um, particular condition. And in our case, because the mining difficulty is two, we're checking if the hash that is generated has two zeros in front. Has two zeros in front. And if it doesn't have, we reiterate and increment the nonce. Something like this. We take the, the string of the transaction, add it to the string of the previous hash, add it to the string of the nonce. So in this case, the nonce is, um, the nonce is zero. So it, it combines the string of the transaction, the string of the previous and the string of the nonce, and it creates a hash of that. Now that hash, it takes the hash and checks that this is our puzzle. 
it checks if the first two letters begin with zero. If the first two letters begin with zero, and if it's not, it, in, it increments the, the nonce until it finds a nonce that gives us a hash with the two begin with the beginning um, the two um, at the beginning uh, the two the two a character at the beginning of the hash would should be zero until we find a nonce that gives us that um, value. So um, with um, this is also the our word the. Or the, the algorithm that is used in blockchain, that is in um, Bitcoin, I'm sorry, in Bitcoin. And um, for Bitcoin, the difficulty might be, it might be more, it might, it might be seven, it might be 10, just to, um, <coughs> that's why you need like a lot of computing resource to compute, computing resource to be able to solve for the value you're looking for. And you make the, the mining difficulty very, very simple because it's, number one, because it's a permission blockchain and because it's, uh, we don't want you to be used like a lot of computer resources to um, solve the, to solve the puzzle because, I mean, it's between um, trusted parties and um, like you don't want to discourage them from using the blockchain. So, there are other types of consensus algorithm. The one we used was proof of work, but there's a proof of stake um, where you, put in a stake in, case, in, in terms of like Bitcoin or Ethereum, you put in um, some Ethereum before you can mine. There's delegated proof of stake, there's proof of authority, proof of importance, proof of elapsed time, proof of capacity, and proof of activity, and proof of form. Um, all these other ones, um, some of them don't use as much computing resources, so they are um, consensus algorithms that we can use in in our in our um, in a supply chain blockchain. So, um, future improvements on our uh, platform would be to use Internet of Things, um, like um, Internet of Things, like track packages and um, RFID scanners that um, send transactions straight to the blockchain. Would be also to use smart contracts. Um, smart contracts between suppliers and retailers and um, crypto wallets so they can exchange your money. And the way I see all of this is that um, supply chain involves like material information, if, uh, material information flow and um, finance, financial capital flow. So all this combines together to be able to, um, to, be able to give like a proper um, decentralized supply chain um, platform. <coughs> And also for the end user, for the end user to be able to see um, where like a particular, to see the, the history of, um, and to track like where a particular group is coming from. And <clears throat> with all this, someone asked me, um, when I told him I was giving this presentation, he asked me like, that he sees today that um, there's a problem and someone just comes up and says, oh, blockchain will solve it, blockchain will solve that. And it, it kind of like, uh, that is blockchain really the solution to like everything because that's what everybody is saying. That kind of like reminded me of this um, um, Gilbert comic uh, where the boss says, I think we, we need a blockchain. And um, it kind of like um, makes me question, um, you have a particular problem. How do you know that blockchain is a particular solution for that uh, problem? And one, um, model to use if you have a problem one model to use to make sure that to know if blockchain will be a solution to that um, in that environment is the fixed model and the fixed model says um if the problem you are trying to solve in the environment it is propensity for high fraud that and if there are a lot of intermediaries if there's um throughput that depend on the number of transactions and the stable data because remember I said in, in a block, for the blocks in the blockchain, the data has to be the same. The data has to be the same. But, and if you're dealing with an environment that has volatile data, you don't want to use blockchain for that because each block has to have um, the, same kind of, uh, the same kind of data. I did a, a product challenge recently and um, 
I saw there was um, this product that someone introduced that um, it's kind of like ride sharing, but it's free. It's called SOMO. And I asked her why it was free, and she said, you can't change mobility if the motivation is money. And I also see it the same with blockchain. You can't change decentralization if your motivation is money. And think of um, how um, Satoshi Nakamoto um, kind of like provided this um, um, technology to the world. His motivation wasn't money, he just it was free and open for anybody to use and it was open source for anybody to use. So you can't change a decentralization if the um, motivation is money. Also you can uh, connect with me on any of the following platforms and this is the end of my talk and what I want to do now is is I want to demo the the software. has started, uh, it has been seeded with three users and see, uh, I start with Walmart. To sign in, we go to um, transactions. So Walmart creates an order, like I would say. So it says Walmart, select the supplier. In the database now, we just have one um, supply, which is stock line. And what items do we want? We want apples. And the quantity is um, 600. So we submit this request. And like I said, the other ID is, is generated. And this transaction has already been mined into the blockchain. So. Um, we can come here and see the other details. So this is the other the details and view tracking information is pending now. So I'll just log out and sign in as top one. That is the supplier that will fulfill the 600 apples. And so you can see this one transaction. So it said it's from a Walmart. So we can view the other details. So where I said we can choose to accept or decline the request. And or accept the request. Confirm. And so a new um, so it was pending. It is now being tracked and it's been approved. So we can update the tracking. So this, um, we're doing it manually now, but if, if, in, if it's being used in like real life, um, the real life, so real world scenario, this update, um, this update will be done by Internet of Things devices, uh, things that uh, track the, the package. And so we, we say like ready for shipping. I'll click confirm and it's been added, a new transaction is being added to the blockchain. So we can ship the order here. And when we ship the order, it says select the courier. Canada Post is the only courier in the database. Confirm. And so it shows that we shipped it to Canada Post. So log out and uh, assign it as the final user. Um, so Canada Post can come here and he can also see the he can see the history of the transactions on the on the on that um, item. We can update the status. 
you can update the status and say maybe delivered or we can transfer the order, like I said, to transfer it to another courier, but there is no other courier in the database, just, um, just Canada Post. So we can update, you can say uh, Let's see a new transaction that we added and the final step is for Walmart to, to now confirm that they have received it. So you can see that Walmart you can also see a history of what has been going on in the um, within the network and um, they can confirm that they received the order. So confirm. So this is just give the tracking information. This is the history of all what has been going on. And um, so if you just commit me, I need you to show the uh, so we can we get the chain now. This is this is all the transaction that were added to the chain. The initiated six hundred apples, six hundred apples, it's been tracked. Um, it's been tracked. You can see that it's the same uh, node ID, so that is kind of, that's kind of like a foreign key that keeps track of the transaction. I can see that here in the track transaction, we do not store the information of um, the, um, the item and the quantity because it will be kind of redundant. It will be kind of redundant, so we just we, we use the node ID to reference it, like I said, and this is just. This is the blockchain element of seven. So that is it for my talk. Thank you all for listening to me. <laughs> Any questions so far? So this uh, you do everything locally, yeah? Everything? Locally, on your local machine. Yes. So it's not uh, like a real application where Walmart is there and supplier is somewhere else. Then you have to, to do the decentralization, yeah? I mean, the, the proof of work you do is just uh, to, to prove that uh, those transaction details, they spin some CPU, yeah? yeah. <coughs> It's not like a hyperledger that's a, a consortium blockchain. Yeah? From, from the scenario you explain, yeah. you have many businesses that uh, they try to, to do a business process across businesses. Yeah? Yeah. So you need like a decentralized yeah, uh, we solution. Just, we just, um, um, local. Like use so many computers, you have to like register this computer into the blockchain and begin to do it. Yeah. Can you tell me about your software stack? Like, what did you use? Like, what was the blockchain technology? Was this something you made? Um, what did you use for the logic? Was it like smart contracts with like Solidity? Or uh, tell me more about that. Uh, we did not use. Um, smart contract, we kind of like built it from scratch. We built it from, we built the, um, we use a Python class, we use Python to build the um, application from scratch, but based on like the, the concept, based on the different concept, like um, the transaction object, um, we did it with generating the public key and private key, we use them, um, um, SHA-256 algorithms with, um, with Python, we did that. We didn't use any um, any outside um, any any um, third party libraries or any third party um, uh, services to review the blockchain from. Cool. 
Yeah, you have that server that's vulnerable, yeah? The yeah. blockchain yeah. server, if someone attacks it's very it. very vulnerable. It's, it's not secure. So I wouldn't advise you to use this, but you just use it to show the uh, concept of the whole uh, using blockchain to the track. I mean, the, the, the next uh, step will be to use like Hyperledger that you have all the ammunition of decentralization and smart contracts and yeah. yeah. Because uh, right now you simulate kind of blockchain behavior with proof of work, that proof of work is not in the purpose of decentralization. Proof of work is just to spin the CPU that you have written something locally to a block, yeah, to link it to the... Basically, they stimulated the output of a real blockchain. Yeah.